And we're live. All right, let's get that presentation up. All right, well, good evening, everyone. And I guess this is the last time I will say good evening to the entire internet who's out there watching us tonight. Uh, my name is Nathan Mylombardo. I'm the Planning and Zoning Administrator for the City of South Fulton. And joining me on the Zoom tonight are Marissa Jackson and Dana Gray, who are planners with the city as well. Um, this is our last number four of four uh, public meetings to go over our zoning rewrite project for the City of South Fulton. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. For those of you watching tonight, um, any comments that you want to make, uh, feel free to submit at any time. Uh, we'll pause periodically throughout the uh, throughout the presentation rather um, to go over those comments and answer any questions as best we can. If any of the comments require follow up, we will do that um, with you within the next day or two. Um, you could submit comments in the YouTube chat right below this box uh, that you're watching us on and that's being monitored right now. Or you can email us, send any notes you want to planning at city of South Fulton GA.gov. Move on. Um, if you've been able to find this presentation, you have most likely been able to find the zoning rewrite website on the city's webpage. Um, the entire draft ordinance is posted there for your review. It's a little over, I think, 322 pages. Um, that is there as a PDF for you to review. Um, any edits in the ordinance? are marked in a few ways. Um, any blue text is new text, it's an addition. Um, there are also highlighted text that's been changed and text with a red strike through that have been uh, deleted. Um, additionally, there is a survey posted online and tonight and tomorrow morning are the last opportunities to take that survey. Uh, the link is on the website there as well. Um, it is a new survey. So if you've taken the old survey previously, please go ahead and take the new one for us. If you have not taken it at all, uh, please take it now for the first time. Um, we put a lot of thought and effort into this survey um, and it is all new questions, as I said. So we really value uh, your participation in that. Uh, the link Can posted- project? One second, I'm not getting yes. YouTube. I'm sorry, I'm not getting YouTube. So Marissa, are we sure it's, it's, it's rolling? Yeah, it's rolling on my phone. Okay. All right. I'll try to you can pause a minute. Do you, need, do you want to just try refreshing your screen? I apologize to anyone watching for, our watching for our technical difficulties. Try refreshing your screen, but I see that it is live on the corner of uh, my screen here as well. Okay. Thank you. But if Mercy, you confirm that we are that we are up. Marissa, did you can, can you confirm that we are up on YouTube? Yep, oh, there I go. Okay. okay fantastic. Great. Okay, great. And the link at the bottom of this slide, uh, th that is a link to the city zoning rewrite page. We will find a link to the survey and the link to the uh, zoning ordinance. Go to the next slide, please. Could we click the next slide, please? There we go. Again, um, we really look forward to anyone and everyone completing that survey for us. If you're a resident, if you're a business owner, um, a developer, um, any, any person interested um, in the zoning of City South Fulton, we really value your input there. We can also take comments at any time at the email address on your screen. That is an email address uh, that goes directly to our consultants. So you have several ways to get a hold of us. You can submit comments in the YouTube tonight. You can email us at planning. Uh, at citysouthfultonga.gov at any time for questions. Um, you can do the survey for us and you can send notes directly to our consultants as well. We can go on to the next slide. So a brief agenda uh, for tonight, we'll talk about the goals of this process first, and then we'll talk about what we have done so far um, in this process, going through the analysis of our existing documents and um, the change that we wanted to make going over the public input steps we've taken so far and the actual draft. And we'll go over that in a little bit of detail. Talk about the key recommendations that have been generated throughout this process for our new zoning. And then the next steps for this process. Move on. 
I'm gonna do my best uh, tonight to not directly read these slides uh, to you, but this is one where I will go over some of the terms um, verbatim. Um, the goals of this process, customize, update, reorganize, and coordinate. So with any zoning document, it's a living and breathing document, it can change at any time. And so we wanna make sure that the current needs of the city are reflected in our zoning ordinance. Our city is a new city. It's only been around for a little over three years. Um, and a lot of our policies, procedures, and ordinances are leftovers from Fulton County, which means some of those ordinances can be decades, 50, 60 years old. And so it's definitely time to take a look at those and refresh them for a more modern time and for more modern needs. We want to update the ordinances to make sure they are compliant with all uh, federal and state regulations. And those, again, can change at any time. And so we want to make sure that we are always on top of making sure we are in compliance at whatever level of government that we need to be in compliance with. If you are familiar at all with our current zoning uh, ordinance, you'll know that it is not user-friendly at all. And I'm sure I'll say the words user-friendly many, many times tonight. Um, but the, the ordinance that we have now, um, there are conflicting regulations. There are sections where things are mentioned uh, multiple times in different places. Um, there is no table of contents um, and no organization really at all of the document. And so um, we wanna make sure that we create a document that is easy to use, that is user-friendly, that anyone who is needing to, to use our zoning um, can operate easily. And that doesn't require uh, advanced degrees to work your way through the document. Um, if you use our current zoning now, you'll see it's just a big PDF and you have to search by a word for the section that you're looking for. And that could, there could be hundreds of hits on, on any given search. So one of the big goals we wanted to make sure we attained was to have a document that was easy for us to use internally and easy for all of our customers to use. And then we wanted to coordinate our, our zoning our ordinance with all of our other planning documents, whether it be the comprehensive plan, zoning maps, um, or application forms that we use um, to, for all of our customers to uh, enter into any of our processes. We wanna make sure that all these documents operate uh, smoothly together. And we can go move on. Um, is there any questions or comments that have come in so far uh, relevant to the slides that we have um, gone through at this point? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, fantastic. So talking about the analysis, what do we do? How do we go over our existing codes to decide what needs to be changed and what needs to be updated? So we're gonna talk about some outdated codes. As I mentioned, the codes that we've been operating under are old Fulton County codes and are, are decades old. And planning processes change, planning theory changes, construction materials change. And so because of that, we wanna make sure that our zoning is representative of modern times. In any zoning document, you're gonna see large sections of definitions and large sections of uses. Um, again, new questions arise over the course of time. We get questions about terms and processes and uses on a daily basis. And so we wanna make sure that we're accurately capturing all of those uses and we'll go over in detail the use charts uh, for all the allowed uses in the various zones in our city. And we also wanna make sure that the definitions that are in our zoning code um, accurately reflect the uses and terms that are used uh, in modern planning and zoning. We'll talk a lot about the specific zoning districts, um, ones we've updated, ones we, ones we have removed, what uses are allowed where and where the zoning areas are. And we'll talk a lot about the overlay districts and what thought went into updating those for modern times. That's where I mentioned a lot uh, about construction materials because the overlay districts in the city of South Fulton uh, generally regulate um, design and architectural requirements uh, for new development. Briefly, we'll talk about processes and procedures. This is something that is important for us internally because we deal with those processes and procedures on a daily basis. And so we wanna make sure that those are able to function smoothly and efficiently. And again, we talked a lot about coordination and consistency, wanting to make sure we're in compliance with all regulations and that we're not contradicting ourselves um, within one document. The next slide, please. This is one of those slides that I, again, I don't really wanna just read verbatim for you, but I wanna stress that the review has been thorough. Um, many topics and hundreds of categories um, within the overlay districts and zoning categories um, in order to, we've reviewed all of those in order to make sure, excuse me, that our regulations are um, 
in agreement with one another and there's no contradictory language in our zoning codes. A big focus, and I wanna stress this because I know a lot of emotions are involved in our zoning, whether it's the uses, it's the overlays and the architectural requirements or the placements of our zones. The overarching focus of this was to improve the formatting of the existing standards. So when you look at our new zoning codes, yes, some things have been changed and modified, but generally it is the same code that we've always had, the same overlays, the same standards, um, just modernized, refined, but put into a different format. So that's the biggest thing. So if you have a particular passage that you're very passionate about or a particular, particular policy that you think is very important, most likely it is still in our code, just uh, moved into a different section. Go to the next slide, please. What I wanna stress with this code is that, or this slide rather, is that the review and analysis was not done in a silo. So we took input from all the agencies within our city that have to work with our zoning, whether it's planning, uh, business licensing, permitting, engineering, code enforcement, all these other um, departments in the city that interact with our zoning and interact with our development process had input um, into this project. And we also met with and took public input from many members of the community, albeit um, residents, business owners, customers of businesses, developers, um, so on and so forth, um, because all of those people interact with zoning and they all have a valuable opinion and important input to give. Go to the next slide, please. One of the things we'll talk about um, individually is the zoning map. Um, and so there were districts um, in our zoning map that were not even used or districts that had very similar language to existing, um, to other districts rather. And so we took that as an opportunity to streamline, um, eliminate some unnecessary zones because we do have a lot of zones in the city um, and create a map that is a little bit easier to use. Um, and again, went over all of our codes to be in compliance with state and federal regulations. The next slide, please. Um, this is really important for us to mention here. So even though we are at the end of this round of public input, um, it's been extensive. So in our second round of public input here, we've had four online meetings and taking um, comments um, online as well as a survey um, at many opportunities, at four different opportunities. But throughout this whole process, which has lasted almost a year and a half, there have been over 600 comments from many different forms. And a lot of this was pre-COVID, so there were public meetings um, held um, in person as well. Um, we had meetings with council members um, as a group and meetings with each individual council member. So each one of your elected officials um, had a chance to meet with our cons consultants and get, give input that was uh, specific to their own district. Can move on? I'm gonna read this out because I think it's important to emphasize this. We've had two planning commission workshops or public workshops nine town halls, 10 other community meetings, in addition to the four that we're doing um, in this round. And said, this is our final public meeting tonight. Um, so for those of you who have enjoyed hearing my voice, it's been my pleasure to, to do this for you. Um, but this is your last time right now. And as I said, the survey that, we're, that is posted will be taken down tomorrow morning. So please take that tonight or early in the morning before it's taken down uh, because your opinion is very important to us. Move on. I wanna show this slide because it's important for us to stress that public input is something that we are soliciting um, at many opportunities all throughout the year and in many different avenues, right? So we're taking public input now in our zoning rewrite and this process will be done um, at the end of October. Um, then we'll, we'll, we will begin a comprehensive planning update um, that will go throughout the end of October next year. And so there'll be a full year of additional public input that we will be working on in the planning and zoning division. Um, transportation in public works, there's a transportation plan that is currently with the council for adoption, um, a park and recreation plan in our parks and recreation department uh, that is currently being worked on. Code enforcement interacts with the public on a daily basis. I'm getting feedback on um, ways they can best serve the community. And we've done an economic development plan recently that is currently with the council. Um, so as I said, I want, I want to say that public opinion and public input is very important in the city of South Fulton. It's something that we value a lot. And we solicit that um, at multiple opportunities um, many times throughing the year. And I'll pause here really quick. There's, if there's any more um, relevant questions or 
or pertinent um, comments that have come in? Uh, from money, easement, will the city have overall authority for easement approvals and adjustments? I think questions like that are going to be really more, really better dealt with on a case by case basis. Um, sir, if you have a very specific question or situation, feel free to, con uh, to contact us in the office. At, you can email any of us and we can do a little more research for you. Um, you know, generally, the easements are going to be set by either utilities or at the county level or state level having to do with streams and things like that. Um, there are certainly easements for roads as well, um, but again, that, that could be a public public works issue or a county level issue, uh, depending on, on the type of easement. So um, the answer that I, that I have for you is not necessarily yes or no, but I think there's a lot of details that could possibly be missing there and that could be very important to answering that question. Um, so give us a little follow up um, with an email to the office and we can do a little more research for you if you have a, if you have a specific area that you are concerned about. Okay, and then he has another uh, statement, customizing zoning, are there any attachments the city has implemented for new construction pathways and sidewalks? I'm not sure that we have any new requirements for those, um, but there are existing requirements um, in the overlays and other areas for streets and sidewalks. Um, so yeah, I said, I'm not sure that there's, there's new ones, if you want us to do a little research about our existing requirements, we could do that for you. Uh, just please email us and let us know. Um, but we do, there is certainly a attention and interest um, on the part of staff and elected officials on making sure that new developments um, include pedestrian friendly amenities and, um, and that those amenities are conducted to the safety of uh, pedestrians and I'll, I'll say um, bicyclists as well. And I do have one from the planning, but this is in reference to the cascade overlay. Okay, let's go ahead and ask it. Okay, so this is from Vanjie Watkins. Uh, uh -huh. Her primary concern is the retention of the overall integrity of the cascade road overlay district. It is her understanding that the consultants determine the intent of each of the overlay districts is unique and to the extent possible should remain as orig originally written and adopted. That being said, she says, I would emphasize the need to retain that part of the code that prohibits signs in the windows of the businesses along Cascade Road from Kroger on the east end to the business in the 4100 Promenade Office Building, Chantier Trail to Danforth Road. My other concern is that there, that there be no changings, changes in the zoning and land use that promote or support regional development at the intersection of Cascade Road and 285. Okay, so two points there. Number one, um, as I mentioned before, and as we'll go over a little bit later when we talk about the overlay specifically, um, there has not been any massive change to the content of the overlays. It's only been updating and some reorganization to eliminate um, inconsistencies and um, con conflicting um, areas, but there is not going to be any big revisions or rewrite to the overlay districts. Um, as far as your question to, about concerning the future land use, that is an issue that is important but will be dealt with in comprehensive planning. So no changes have been made to any future land use map at this point and any changes that will be made will be decided when we do comprehensive planning over the next maybe 15 months or so, but there will be significant opportunity to uh, give input on any future land use map changes that may be happening in the future. Is there any other questions that's coming now? One more. Okay. Uh, money, is there an ADA or disability section regulations in the new code? So I, I'm not sure that the answer to that is yes, because that may be in the, I don't believe there is an ADA compliance section in the zoning. I think that ADA is going to be listed in a building section of our um, ordinances, which is just simply a separate section. I will say that 
and I, you know, obviously uh, we have to, all buildings have to be fully ADA compliant. So there shouldn't be any concern um, about ADA compliance in new construction in any way whatsoever. That should not be a concern because buildings uh, certainly have that requirement. I just believe it's in a uh, different section of our city ordinances. And I think our building inspectors, when they go out for new construction, do is inspect along those lines. Correct. Those those are federal guidelines, and so that is absolutely required. And that is it for now. Okay, we'll move on. We can go to the next slide, please. All right. Two of the things that will be really important to us um, internally, and I hope to everyone who um, has to interact with the zoning code as a policy document in the future will be these points here. Number one, um, the size of the document has been reduced um, because it's now organized more efficiently. So we've gone from 34 articles to 10. Now those 10 are listed on the left-hand side of the table um, and there is a new table of contents. So you can easily research the information that you're looking for. Not only is there a table of contents for the whole document, but each article has its own table of contents. And so researching thing is no longer need to be done by searching in, um, in a search box in a PDF, but they'll actually be page numbers um, and a table of contents for you to scan through to find all the details that you need to find. It's just a wonderful change. And going back to being user-friendly, it's one of those things that's gonna really make a huge difference for people that need, need to work with our, our zoning code as a policy document. Next slide. So let's talk about the key recommendations that have been made by our consultants, by our staff analysis, and by our public input. Um, again, we're just gonna go over this very briefly here. Um, the allowed use is something we're gonna go over um, in detail. We're gonna go through the use tables and the disallowed use tables um, in a little while. Um, but those uses include commercial um, and industrial uses. We'll talk about the zoning districts um, specifically and the overlay districts. And then we'll go through some of the development standards that have been changed and some of the recommendations that have been made there uh, and incorporated. A lot of that has to do with modernization of architectural requirements, as we'll see. We can move on. One of the things that you'll see in our current zoning is that each section has a list of allowed uses and they're not all in the same place. So you have to search many different sections for many different uses and it's just not a great way to be doing it. Um, and so one of the things that we've developed um, is a use chart, which we'll, which we'll see. And one of the strongest recommendations was to consolidate all those uses in one place. And a lot of us in, in staff kind of feel that, you know, that use table will kind of become a user guide for people. It'll be easy to print off. Um, for any of you wanting to go through the use table ahead of time or, or search for them, at the end of article two is the list of allowed uses. It's 22 pages, I believe, or 23 pages of allowed uses. And at the end of article three is the list of disallowed uses. Um, and so also one of the uh, recommendations that we'll go over is a greater distinction between our commercial areas. We wanted to have one that's a little bit more neighborhood scale and one's a little more um, higher traffic, higher intensity commercial scale, which we'll talk about some um, examples of that in just a few minutes. We can move on. One of the recommendations here, tighten restrictions. Um, that means where things, that means sort of determining the best placement for uses, uh, determining which zone is the most appropriate area for different uses, um, increasing distance between uses, um, a, a recent example that we deal with often are um, dollar stores, dollar general, um, places like that. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about not wanting to have those populate all throughout the city. And so there's been a lot of discussion had about how far apart those should be, how many can be allowed in a certain area. And discussion was had by that for, for several of, you, uh, of the different uses. Um, then again, in terms of non-residential uses here, Ambiguity, ambiguities with classifications, right? So this, this kind of goes along with the idea of user friendliness in terms of wanting to make sure that uses are correctly identified and correctly classified. A lot of times with our current uses, because they're not very extensive um, and they're not very detailed, a lot of uses fall through the crack or are up for interpretation. And I want to try to eliminate that because you never really know when someone says that they're gonna do one thing, they could easily end up doing something else with their business or at their space. 
And we want to make sure that we try and capture as much as possible ahead of time, obviously. And then with residential uses, we want to make sure that we focus on the development standards so that future residential development is adequately spaced um, and properly constructed in order to, to promote high quality neighborhoods with proper um, property values. Um, and we'll, so that we, we want to promote quality development so the property values continue to increase and remain stable as opposed to having development that it, um, would not uh, stand the test of time. Can we move on, please? So let's talk about commercial first. I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. So one of the focus here was to make sure that our commercial areas were reflective of their proximity to residential neighborhoods. Um, and this is a really good example listed here. So a C1 is typically gonna be your less intensive uses and uses that you may want closer to your home um, that, they, that may even foster a sense of community. Uh, for example, uh, an open air restaurant and bar is a place where people are gonna gather, have a good time with their families, meet up with friends. They may wanna walk there, um, or bike there. Um, and it serves a really uh, clear use. Whereas a tire store, auto repair store, it serves a necessary use, but it may not be something that is, you're gonna want um, so close to your home, or you're may gonna, may gonna want it to be located on a more heavily trafficked thoroughfare. And so it's important that all we recognize that although all these uses are important and have a place and value, that they are properly placed uh, throughout the community and that our zoning reflects that we have put some thought and intent into making sure that the right uses are in the right places. And we also wanted to make sure that our commercial uses um, support the goals and, and ideas laid forth in our economic development plan. One of those plans that we talked about earlier that is with the council now, and that was, and that has been an opportunity for public input over the course of time. Let's move on. So industrial, this is always an interesting slide to go to because we know that industrial uses are important to the city of South Fulton because uh, they're a great tax, tax um, base have very good revenues for the city, they provide jobs, um, and it's a very valuable piece of our community. We also know that we've been subject to kind of, I don't wanna say unregulated, um, but sort of unlimited uh, development patterns and, and industrial use by Fulton County over time. And so we're dealing with industrial uses um, that have been not given the right amount of thought and the right amount of effort um, over the course of time, and we have to deal with the repercussions currently. Um, and so we want to make sure that the industrial uses that we allow in the city are appropriate for the type of environment that we want to have. And we'll talk a lot about this when we get to the disallowed uses, but the example here on your screen. So a flex space um, and a light warehousing facility is a, it's, it's a fine, it's a good use. Um, it's not environmentally adverse. Um, it provides good jobs uh, and it's a needed uh, service uh, in the city in terms of our workforce, in terms of tax base that we want. Uh, whereas an incinerator is a heavy industrial use, but it's not the kind of industrial use that we want to see um, expanding in the city. And so uses like that have been moved to a, a table that are, that are now ex ex explicitly banned um, in the city. So hopefully what we'll see happening over time is that the industrial uses that will continue to come into the city are not the kind of industrial uses that are harmful to the environment. Um, and I think that's a really good thing. I'm gonna pause right here really quickly to see if there's any questions that have come in. Yes, I have one from YouTube. Elise sure. Fisher, what is the proposed mixed CGA zone? How does it compare to the existing Cedar Grove overlay? So that is a really good question because the mixed CGA zone is one of the zones that is being uh, removed from the active zoning list. So although there are properties that are currently zoned that, no new properties can be zoned that in the future. Um, and so the mixed CGA zone is gonna be an inactive uh, zoning area in our city. We are not going to actively rezone those on our own, but those mixed CGA areas will not be allowed to expand. Um, if they wanted to expand, they would need to be zoned to just our regular uh, mixed use. Are there any other questions? That's it. Okay, now we can go to the next slide, please. So we're gonna dive into the um, use tables now. And if you have any questions that come up um, concerning any use um, that you see or any use you don't see, 
please feel free to ask that at any time in, uh, in terms of submitting that comment or, or email. Um, but all these tables are designed to be user-friendly and to be sort of quick guides for uh, business license approvals and new businesses coming into the city. Um, we're very excited about these. And so after the um, allowed use tables, we will also go over the disallowed use tables. So we can pause now and go over the first uh, use tables. All right, so let's pause here really quickly. Um, I just wanna go over the format of these tables for anybody watching, um, just so they know what they're looking at. Um, across the top of the table are the different zoning districts listed R1, R2, et cetera, et cetera. And the first tables that we're seeing here are the residential uh, tables. So we'll get to the commercial industrial tables um, in just a few minutes. Um, over on the side of the chart, you'll see a column um, on the right-hand side that lists the restrictions. So article two, um, in our zoning has to deal with all of the uses that are allowed in the city. And so article three has to deal with all of the restrictions um, on those uses. So you'll see some of the uses have specific um, sections that have uh, qualifications for them listed um, in a separate section of our zoning ordinance. Um, in this chart, anything marked with an A is an allowed use. Anything marked with S is a special use that requires a, a special permit. Um, and if a cell is blank, it is prohibited um, in, that, in that zone. So we can just start scrolling slowly here. And you can see as an example here of how the formatting will work, you can see that there's um, uses there that are struck through and those are no longer allowed uses. So you have all of your different types of residential um, dwelling units. Let's pause here for just one second. You'll see there are some non-residential uses allowed such as churches, schools, um, some daycare facilities, but these all require special uses and a special permit. Keep scrolling. I do have a quick question. Sure. Will, uh, this is from money. Will the city code Let's have a here, special please. use code regulation attractive to organizations such as Goodwill? Just that again, please. Okay. Uh, will city code have a special use code regulation attractive to organizations such as, as, such as Goodwill? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question to be honest, but I will say that what I have noticed in terms of Goodwill is that those, those um, reselling shops that they have will typically be classified as any other commercial um, business. So there shouldn't be any um, challenge um, if Goodwill wanted to come in and set up a one of the resale stores, um, because that would be a regular um, commercial use. And so I want to make a point right here on this um, use chart, and I pause here at, the, at every every meeting to make the same point. But um, the line here is talking about um, telecommunication towers and cell towers. Um, and those are allowed by special use. And I just wanna make note of the fact, number one, they are allowed by special use. So you shouldn't um, anticipate seeing radio towers popping up anywhere around your, your neighborhoods. I also wanna stress that modern radio towers typically reuse existing utility poles or can be much smaller than they have been in the past. Um, furthermore, when a new large tower has to go up, oftentimes you'll see those um, built in groves of trees and painted and decorated to look like a tree. Um, so a lot of thought when it goes into placing cell phone towers. Um, I know we all are completely addicted and dependent on our cell phones. I'm talking to you on a cell phone right now, but um, don't think that we're gonna have towers just appearing all over the city just because you see it as a listed use here. So we can keep scrolling. I also wanna make a note um, that we're getting close to the short-term rentals, which is gonna be your Airbnbs. Um, those are allowed, but they are heavily regulated in chapter three. Yeah, we get a lot of questions about those. So again, Airbnbs are allowed, but they are heavily regulated in the city. So we can keep scrolling. So let's pause here real quick, please. So these are all accessory uses to um, residential um, uh, areas. And so they're gonna be things um, like your mother-in-law suites in your backyards, detached um, accessory dwelling units. 
Um, those can't be used as apartments for rent, but can be used for family members to live in and things like that. So again, all of these are accessory uses to the residential um, residential um, uses and areas. So we can keep scrolling. All the temporary uses listed here will require a special permit. Um, so just make, make a note of that if you see those in this chart. We can keep going. And I believe we're gonna be the non-commercial, non, non, so we can pause right here. We're in the non-residential districts now. Um, again, if you have any questions about any of these uses that you see or any uses that you don't see, uh, please let us know either in the comments, in the email, or you can email us at any time um, to go over those. Again, these are gonna be your C1, um, office industrial mixed use and industrial manufacturing areas. So we can start scrolling. We'll just go through these. I will make a note that our mixed use um, ordinance requires a residential component. So you will not see um, standalone commercial development um, in mixed use zoned areas without um, associated residential development uh, with it. I have a question. What sure? What is amateur radio antenna? That's really going to be a hobbyist. I don't think a lot of people do CB radios um, or long distance radios anymore. I think that, I think that's a remnant of old Fulton County zoning from the sixties and seventies. I remember where I used to work. Uh, we had it was uh, in Garden City near the city of Savannah. And we had old Chatham County zones, and amateur radio antenna was sure useless there as well, but. So it's a, it's a use listed that is a remnant of the past, but it's not something that people do a lot of anymore. But that's, again, not something that you're going to see a uh, 100 foot tower in someone's backyard with either. And so he, I guess he's, uh, money is explaining a little bit better uh, or more something that would make the city more attractive to 5013C organizations. Okay, so any policies we put into place to give incentives to um, specific businesses or nonprofits to come in is going to be handled in our economic development department. Um, I don't necessarily think that that is a bad idea or a bad policy, but specific incentives for certain groups would just not be handled um, in the zoning ordinance. But if you know of any policies or uh, procedures or groups that you think we should be working with in the city, uh, please let us know and we can do a little bit of homework to uh, look into those things. And you'll see in these charts that all the, all the uses are listed um, under similar groups by their NAICS code. And the NAICS code are codes that are used in economic development surveys and in uh, these by the Census Bureau to identify certain businesses and gather economic data. Um, and so if you're searching for a certain type of retail, it'll be sorted by a higher grouping of those. And this is a pretty standard um, thing you see in a lot of places, um, but it's a big change for us, but it's a welcome change and a, a welcome step of reorganization. Any other questions that have come in? Yes, Jeffrey Knoll. Is there any standard lot size for single family dwelling, i.e. one third acre per house? Each one of our residential areas has minimum lot sizes for houses. So the answer is yes. I don't have all of those memorized, um, but if you look in our zoning, even our current zoning, each residential zoning district will have um, minimum lot sizes and uh, density uh, maximums uh, for the given areas. And Dana, if any more come in, feel free to just ask them um, as they come. Okay. 
Let's pause here real quick. I just want to make a note that when we're getting to these industrial uses, um, a lot of these um, heavier uses or uh, more environmentally adverse uses have been moved to the uh, disallowed use table, which we will be going over in just a few minutes. Um, so just make special note of that. Um, we get a lot of questions about these kind of uses, about recycling, about composting, um, and they are um, going to be expressly disallowed in the future. I'm gonna keep scrolling. And again, remember that any temporary use is going to require a permit to uh, to be allowed to happen. And we do have specific requirements for those as well. Move to the bottom of this table. All right, so now we're going to switch over to the banned uses. Um, again, this that the chart that we just went over is in the end of section two. And so, if you were look look want to look over that or looking for it um, expressly, it'll be in in article two. Um, this table here is the end of article three. Um, a lot of these uses have been in the code for a while, but they were um, they were effectively banned through spacing. And we've gotten decided to just get rid of the spacing requirements and just directly ban them, which is going to be a lot easier for everybody to understand. Um, again, a lot of these are going to be your environmentally adverse manufacturing uses, chemical things, um, quarrying, composting, uh, landfills, things like that. So you can start scrolling and go through these. And I have another question. Sure. Are there any rules slash specs slash guardrails for the proposed mixed use areas to ensure that a true and or desired mix of uses will be possible? Um, so the answer to that is yes. Um, and I would encourage you to read through our mixed use zone requirements um, specifically for that. What I can tell you is that our mixed use requires a residential component. So if an area zone mixed use, it must have a mix of uses. So it, there, there will not be a mixed use area that's developed just as a commercial strip mall or just as an apartment building. The uses are required to be intermingled in there and there are requirements for how much has to be there and minimums. So uh, the answer to your question is yes. Um, and there will be uh, requirements for mixes. Again, you can see a lot of these uses on, on the band use table, metal fabrication, coating, industrial spray painting, uh, smelting, that would be, that would be awful. Um, a lot of these are gonna be the, the really environmentally adverse uses and things you definitely wanna heavily regulate. And in our case, get rid of. Keep in mind too, that some of these uses may be um, currently in the community and in places. Um, we certainly cannot shut businesses down, but we can stop the spread of new ones. And that's the intent. So I have something from money. All 501c3 organizations, specifically Goodwill, should have a variance allowance section within the code. Can that be, as you ask, investigated? Uh, we definitely can. If you have any specific ideas for what variances might be most appropriate, that would certainly be helpful. 
we can go back to our presentation now. So that was the end of those two tables. Again, it's the end of chapter two and end of chapter three uh, for those. So let's talk a little bit here now about the zoning map. Um, what I wanna stress here is not going over this, this map in detail. As you can see, the city is very large and it's a very complicated zoning map. Um, so we can't really see it at, at a scale like this. The point I wanna make here are two. Number one is uses or, or zoning districts that were not currently in use and didn't have a high potential for a future use have been removed. Um, some zoning areas have been consolidated um, and moved to a section of the zoning code for um, uses that are, that are no longer gonna be used in the future. Um, again, just to streamline and make our zoning more efficient. Um, something that we also wanna look about doing in the future is updating our map. Um, you can see right now that there are a lot of colors on the map um, and that what that makes for is again, not a very user-friendly experience. So part of this will be developing a new, a new zoning map um, only because I've been looking at this for, for days now as I, I know what I'm seeing here, but at the top of the, the, the color chart there and the purples, those are the industrial uses. Uh, the the right below those are commercial and all of the many colors at the bottom are residential. So we have residential that are orange and brown and blue and green, which makes for a very complicated map. So one of the things you wanna do typically is have like uses be a similar color palette. So for example, you could have all your residential uses be um, a certain shade of blue and you could have your non-intensive residential areas be a light blue and your more intensive residential areas, more dense, be a dark blue. Um, and then with commercial, let's say it was yellow. You could have your light commercial be, your, your light commercial be light yellow and your heavier commercial be uh, darker yellow or orange. So typically you would wanna see a gradient of light colors near each other. So you'd wanna see light, blue, light blues near light yellows. You might wanna see darker yellows not bordering any residential areas. And you might wanna see industrial areas not bordering any residential areas. You might wanna see lighter greens and darker greens all, all in the similar areas or going down one, per, one uh, roadway. And so what you want, and so as those over time, you wanna see those colors sort of start migrating towards one another um, because you would hope the zoning and development changes and, and patterns over time put like things near like things and appropriate things near appropriate things. And so having an updated map is gonna be very, a uh, very helpful tool for us um, internally. Um, and for any of those um, people just needing to know, needing to know zoning of, of certain properties, uh, if you know that all residential areas are, are different shades of blue, you can quickly look at a map and know where the, where the residential areas are as opposed to needing to read the key and decipher which blue is which. You can go on, please. Um, for the overlays, you know, I wanted to state again, um, the intent was not to go over the overlays and redo them. We know that there are a lot of uh, passions in the in the overlays. A lot of um, care was put into developing those, but they were also developed close to 30 years ago at this point. So the intent of those was just to modernize the construction guidelines and reorganize them so it's easier for people to use. We wanted to maintain those standards, um, but just improve the usability. A good example are the um, color, reg re um, color regulations and recommendations. Um, before it was just a list of Pantone colors, and now there's gonna be actual color swatches um, in the ordinance for people to reference. Can go on, please. One of the big things, and we'll talk about this later, uh, are lighting standards, making sure that we're requiring LED bulbs and not just incandescent bulbs. Um, we want to make sure that our citywide standards are um, congruent throughout the zoning ordinance and not different in other areas other than the overlays, uh, because there are architectural and design guidelines that uh, qualify or, or are required in the entire city and not just in overlays. So I wanna make sure that all of this kind of talks together and works together. Um, any issues that we have with the overlays in terms of where they are or where they might go in the future, I know that we have some areas of the city that do not have any overlays, um, could be addressed in our upcoming, comp upcoming comprehensive planning efforts. And I think um, a good discussion about the effectiveness of overlays and the appropriateness of the current standards in all of them is, is a worthwhile discussion to be having. Can move on, please? So we'll go over all these um, uh, on their own slide briefly, but the standards address citywide lighting, exterior cladding, such as um, siding um, types, the rec reflectivity of windows, um, buffers and setbacks is something that we have to deal with all the time. We get questions about them all the time. 
and then signs. I want to stress also that signs have become their own section in the code. So I definitely envision that sign companies and, and other developers that put up signs a lot on their properties uh, will just print out a copy of, I believe it's Article 7, um, to have as a quick guide for their, for their development and for in their businesses. And is there any new comments that have come in? Uh, no. Okay, we can move on. So in terms of lighting, again, updating the design standards and overlays to incorporate LED instead of incandescent bulbs. Want to make sure that lighting uh, standards are sufficient for certain areas because you want uh, safety to be a priority. And you want to make sure that light pollution um, is taken into consideration. Um, and I, I made this note at the other uh, meetings, and I'll do the same here. Um, it's important that light not be um, a pollutant. Um, light can be directed to go a certain way and to be at a certain brightness. So if you are living in a place that is affected by light pollution um, due to the, your proximity to roads or billboards or commercial development or industrial development, please let us know. And we can take a look and see what's going on in that situation uh, because there are guidelines for how bright things can be uh, where and when. Uh, move on, please. In terms of exterior materials, um, the example I give here a lot is vinyl siding. Um, is a material that's been used um, a lot in the past. It's not used so much um, in new construction, which I think is a good thing. Um, but we want to make sure that the types of materials that are regulated and called for in our zoning guidelines are appropriate to fostering high quality development and maintaining property values. So we want to make sure that uh, cladding materials and um, architectural guidelines uh, are both high quality and durable um, so that they are easy to clean and last a long time. Um, those help promote um, better communities and better property values. Next slide, please. So we get questions about buffers all the time. Um, what I really wanna say here is that number one, we have challenges when it comes to the development going on around us. Um, the city's borders are unique, shall we say. And so there are a lot of opportunities for development in adjacent municipalities to affect the city. Um, we obviously cannot regulate development in neighboring municipalities, but we can do what we can to affect new development reacting to that development. So if, and I'll make an egregious example of it, if there was an industrial development on the border of the city and some houses were being built in South Fulton next to that development, we could make sure that sufficient spacing was in place so that the impact of the industrial development on new residential construction would be as limited as possible. Um, and so that's, I think that's the, the, the main point there. We also wanna make sure that there are sufficient buffers and spacing in between um, residential and commercial and industrial development within the city. Uh, this is something that we deal with, as I said, every day and we take very seriously. Um, and so please know that buffering requirements um, have been dealt with and addressed and kept um, significant and important in the zoning rewrite changes. Move on. Same situation with setbacks. We get a lot of questions about setbacks and I've made the same um, example all four times. I'll do it again now. Have you ever seen the movie um, the Truman Show or um, Edward Scissorhands where they go in those subdivisions and all the houses look the exact same. And that's sort of the look that we are not going for. We wanna make sure that our residential neighborhoods um, are architecturally interesting and have some variance. And so setbacks and staggering um, is important and those have been codified because we get asked questions on those all the time. And a lot of times those are put in place as zoning conditions. And so we wanna make sure that there's not a need to do that we want to make sure that it's a standard part of our zoning for everywhere. You move on. And we are right on schedule. So um, is there any last questions that have come in? Any questions or comments? Uh, no. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening tonight and participating. This is the last um, online meeting we're going to hold for this um, round of public participation. If you have any other questions or comments, uh, please get those submitted in all the avenues that we've talked about tonight. And please go take the survey online. Um, that'll be up for us at the rest of the night. And we really, really value the opinion uh, there. We should be getting um, a final copy of our zoning within the next week to week and a half. That'll be with the council to review and we're getting their comments as well. A final copy will be posted online um, to, uh, to read and to provide any, any input for. 
Um, hopefully we'll have adoption of this document um, by the last week of October. Uh, we are really looking forward to it. That's gonna be a great uh, step in the right direction for our city. And I wanna thank everybody for listening and participating. I wanna thank Dana and Marissa for helping me out all these meetings. I couldn't have done it without you. It's been a lot of fun. Um, yes, and again, can. thank you all so much. And I look forward to talking with everybody soon. Thank you. Have a great night.